going to go ahead and get started now. Um, my name is Dave Mark. Uh, the thing is, though, I am going to represent, for what it's worth, all of the AI devs in the world. <laughs> Kill me now. <laughs> and I don't have, hang on, oh, my slides disappeared now. Let me do this, restart that, and send it over, and now it should show up. Um, because I am going to get bombarded with a wish list, and hopefully <laughs> no foul language, from my, my five panelists up here who um, have uh, many things to say on this particular subject. So introducing really quick, um, Noah... Uh, Falstein on the left, Robin Hunnicky, Raph Koster, Laurel McWilliams, and um, I've heard your name before, right? Richard Lamarche. Richard Lamarche. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I wish, no, it's Richard Lamarche, didn't it? Lamarche. <laughs> it sounded a bit like one of those Ubisoft devs for a second. Maybe. We. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> anyway, um, the, uh, the, uh, back when we first started the summit, we did something in 2010 very similar to this. Um, where we asked designers via email a whole bunch of questions. Uh, what limitations are you sick of hearing about? What, what can film directors do with cast and crew that you can only dream of with your, your AI characters? Uh, things like that. And then we actually had a, a, a panel up here of some really, really nifty, out-of-the-box thinking AI devs. So it's kind of the reverse of this. And so we iterated through those answers that those designers gave us and kind of you know, batted around, well, how would we handle that? Um, now, in, to some extent or another, many of those issues have been solved, yes, it's in quotes, um, because we have advanced quite a bit in the past you know, nine years or so since we did this. Um, but apparently not well enough, or there's new issues, because in 2012, uh, Warren Spector made waves amongst the, uh, us AI folks um, in a Eurogamer interview where he said, I've been actively trying to shame my fellow developers, specifically John Carmack and Tim Sweeney, he said, can you imagine what games would look like if those two guys spent as much time working on non-combat AI as on rendering? Can you imagine what they would look like if they w uh, wanted to create a believable com character as opposed to a believable gun? I mean, oh my God, these guys are way smarter than I. I don't know how to solve the problem, but they could figure it out. Stop rendering, start creating humans or mice. I don't care which. Of course, he was working at Disney at the time. Um, so, Deep then, cuts. <laughs> I don't know what the state of mice AI is right now. Um, but uh, he went on here uh, at GDC, uh, down the hall from us, and I got wind of this later that day, where Warren was trashing on the AI summit down at the Narrative Summit, um, where he, he says, we have to spend time on non-combat AI. We figure out pathfinding and not having characters fall into holes in the ground and stuff like that. How do we outflank the enemy? We spend no time on going to the women's bathroom and having people notice, which is interestingly topical. Um, people still come up to me and say, wow, that was so cool. That was 13 years ago. Apparently it was something he had done in one of his prior games I was not aware of. Mm -hmm. Have you seen a game where a drink was spilled and a character responded appropriately? I think not. Have you seen a game where there was a spurned lover that mattered and it wasn't just a movie masquerading as a game? like a cutscene. Have you ever seen a game where there was a would-be lover that you could interact with? If anybody knows how to create a virtual game master, putting me in a box or you in a box, I want to know. Good stories are constructed, not found. Emergence can only get us so far. And if we can dynamically modify stories based on what players want to do, a good D&D &D campaign, you know, you want to screw around with the dungeon master. And he actually responds. So this is what he had said down the hall, and we chatted later that week about this, and a, and a couple of times since then. Um, Were you but, shamed? Yeah, well, yes. Were you appropriately shamed by Warren? Yeah, that I'm not John Carmack. <laughs> 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 um, I, I, that's what you get for representing all AI devs everywhere, I guess, right? Um, so anyway, uh, Warren wanted to be on this panel and uh, desperately, but this is apparently the first GDC he's going to miss since the Civil War. Um, <laughs> ah, he's old. <laughs> <laughs> he, he wanted me to let him watch this video. Warren so was one of my Warren's one of my, my closest friends okay. and mentors, so I'm just yeah, teasing nice him because he's not here. Um, so, but he did answer a number of questions that I posed to him through email, and we'll see those sprinkled through. But we have a number of different topics that we have talked about over the past couple of weeks that we want to cover 
that subscribe to kind of their wish list. And we're, so we're just going to go through them in a topical order and see who has what to say on these things. We're not going to dive deep into technical solutions other than I may prod them, okay, wait a minute, hold on. What would that look like? What do you mean by that? Well, you know, to get a little bit more information. The goal of this is for us to sit here and go, how would we solve that? Because that would make our games better. So uh, the first topic I want to talk about is, is character AI. Um, just which is normally what we do, whether it be combat or non-combat, and just have uh, you folks throw out a couple of things, just in general, what would make characters better that you're not seeing, that you sit there and go, oh, if we could only pull this off. Hit me, what do you got? Well, one of the things that I would love to see is recognition from characters that I am playing the game in a unique way. Yeah. So, for example, uh, I have a... A follower in Skyrim or in Fallout, and they comment on things in the world, and they comment when we're attacked, but they comment in a general way. Yeah. They don't comment at all about what I do. Uh, they don't comment on how I solve problems, on the fact that um, I had to take a healing potion, on the fact that um, I tripped over something, or I got stuck on a rock, or changed weapons. They, they don't seem to understand that I'm playing the game in a way that somebody else, you know, is unique versus somebody else. And that's something that we can gather. I mean, we, we know if we watch patterns of player behavior when players are doing, behaving differently under certain circumstances. And there's no reason that, uh, I mean, it's even as simple as recognizing when I go to turn in a quest in a game like Destiny, that uh, my group, or uh, when I go to turn in after a strike, that my uh, fire team wiped three times, but finished it anyway, yeah. right? We know that because yeah. I literally just did it. There's no reason not to track it. I'm sure they're tracking it in metrics, too. So if you have it from metrics, why not have the game reflect that back to me and let me feel special like the game recognizes me as a unique player? Yeah, I think we focus, we over-focus on false plasticity with the character representation itself rather than actually looking at the data that we're constantly ignoring. And I think it's really, it's really bad. I mean, you can just even just track what, how often they press the controller and find out whether they're frustrated. You know, in Journey, a lot of the stuff that we did to edit down the relationship between two people involved paying attention to both people and then sort of smoothing over their differences. And a lot of people thought that the other character was an AI. Like, if it had been an AI, wouldn't that have been the best fucking AI programming in the whole world, you know? Because it actually paid attention to you. It was fake plastic, right? We do a lot of fake plastic in games, and that kind of plasticity would be really fantastic. Uh, I, I have a little bit, though, actually, uh, around the, the fake plasticity, because yeah. I think that, um, I don't think this is as important as what you've been discussing, but I do see a lot of low-hanging fruit around the way that uh, NPCs, whether they are um, uh, enemies or allies, um, perform their kind of individual identities. And across the course of the Uncharted games, you know, we did a little bit more each game around sort of, I think a lot of it has to do with head tracking, yeah. gaze tracking, uh, whether um, people, uh, somebody gives somebody the side eye, um, gait, and the way that characters hold themselves in idle animations and these kinds of things. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with the spatial uh, distances that um, sort of um, non-hostile NPCs in particular maintain to the player character. And the, the kind of surprise reactions that they do when the player character comes right up to them and like gets in their face and how they jump back and how quickly they jump back. I know some of this is sort of um, processing time related and, and we're able to get more and more prompt with a, a sort of NPC reactions all the time. I, I still think there's lots and lots of uh, low-hanging fruit uh, right there. So you, what I'm hearing is from you is a reactivity um, to just immediate stimulus. Yes. Your recent past stimulus. Mm -hmm. um, Play patterns, and, really. So yeah, exactly. You know, I really loved the, the example when we were chatting about the, um, the way you play Fallout. Yeah, so tell, when I... Tell yeah. that. That's yeah. great. So when I play Fallout, I have a, a pretty reliable pattern that I always play sniper. So I stay sighted even when enemies are getting pretty close. It takes, they have to get really up in my face before I'll switch to shotgun or something. Except rad scorpions, because they, they freak me out. Um, and so when a rad scorpion is approaching me, my play pattern radically changes. I am shooting wildly. I'm fumbling, I'm backpedaling like a mad woman, and that's when I, why I say tripping, that NPC should notice when I'm tripping, because I'm constantly tripping over things, because I'm backpedaling. I'll get up on rocks to try to avoid it. I'll go unsighted much faster and switch to the shotgun much faster. If the game paid any attention at all, it would be totally clear that red scorpions freak me out. There's no reason that the NPC with me could not comment on that. Or if you want to be terrible, if you're making a horror game, that you couldn't take advantage of that, because now you know what in the game scares me the most. 
And that's evil. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when uh, you mentioned this, Lauren, there's something that I learned a couple of years ago from the world of improv theater uh, relating to high and low status characters that seem totally actionable in the world of uh, AI for characters in games. There are these, um, it, it comes out of the work of Keith Johnston, who identified that sort of uh, high, people who perceive themselves as high status are more still, they, their gaze is a little higher. Mm -hmm. um, people who perceive them, think of themselves as low status are sort of a bit more turned in on themselves, their, their toes point in, um, they touch their face a lot, and they, they act kind of quickly and more nervously. And I think we could do a lot of that quite easily uh, in the yeah, okay. well, All right, is, devil's advocate. Yeah. Hey, that's the animators. But that's, no, 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 that's, no, that's bullshit. Like, that's total bullshit. That's like paying attention to how people actually are and then building systems that reflect how people actually are. And like the, the difference between AI that is plastic for real and AI that is fake plastic is paying attention to what real is. Hmm. Like get out of your head and the problem space of how do I respond in a, you know, a relatively short time loop? How do I get this animation cycle to work and have the foot planting be perfect? What? That kind of paying attention is, is not, it's not paying attention to the level where it's really gonna make an emotional impact. And you can actually fake a lot of that other stuff with art style. The thing you can't fake is what Richard's talking about, which is the way that humans actually respond to one another in the space. And uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, just to be contrary about this, I, uh, thinking about this panel, a lot of my sense of these questions of how do we make you know, computers do these things, they suck at a lot of this stuff. Yeah, they and do. we have millions of years of evolution having us focus on the kind of stuff that Richard was just talking about, you know, our, our primate ancestors, there's all sorts of, uh, my sister used to work with chimps and being with a group of chimps and being with a group of game developers, it can be really hard to tell the difference. <laughs> and, but he made that joke and not me. Uh, no, 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 this is, I, I, you know, I realized my own kind of uh, body language is completely compatible with the, what the chimps are doing. Yeah. Here, but the point being, Make have the AI control, you know, scorpions or animals, or have them control computers. You know, I, I would love we, at Google we had a, a proposal for this game called Bot or Not, and the idea was that you didn't know if the other characters were bots or humans, but your your job as a human was to be the most convincing bot you could be. So Chris why is working on why make <laughs> Chris is going to finish yeah, that problem right? What, why make why make you know have the AI make the humans seem more realistic? Make it see, do realistic robots and. Granted, we would love to have it do a lot more than that, but you know, I, I look but for if, the low hanging fruit. But when do we one. start? When do we really start looking? I mean, when do we really start trying to figure out the subtle thing that people already do with hand animation to make a character seem real when it's clearly a bunch of lines moving on a, a flat screen? You know, well, we don't even there, do there it with other players. There are ways to cheat. Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can cheat. Yeah, we don't even do it with other players, right? Like, the amount of emotional bandwidth that comes through with another player in an online game is basically nil. It's terrible. We don't do the simple things like eye track. Yeah. Well, we well, don't do the simple point. things like, you know, gaze and head moving to whoever spoke most recently. We don't do body language for precedence or any of that. But I think fundamentally, though, if, if I kind of summed up what, what all of these comments add up to me is we are in a habit for a whole bunch of reasons of building our characters as props that are primarily reactive. And if we want to exploit AI, they need to have their own inner lives, out of which this stuff arises organically. War. They should be scared of you because they remember you and go, oh crap, this guy kills random civilians. Right? I mean, oh, none of us ever do that. You know, but that requires, it, it's not that we lack, we have, we have the CPU, we have the RAM these days, yeah. okay? It's not a question of capability. I think a lot of what we just said is actually trivially easy and not a challenge for you guys. Instead, it's a matter of will. We have to actually choose to prioritize characters over props. Yeah, and, and I, I think well, we all... Inspectors, I want to read this quote because it's exactly what you were just saying. This is, uh, I'd wish for better non-combat AI we do really well now in creating convincing combat behaviors individually in groups, but our characters can't do the simplest real-world things in response to different kinds of inputs that games typically allow. There's a reason why love stories and intimate dramas aren't getting made, and AI is a big part of that. And it comes down to that subtlety of who are they? Is, is that an accurate... Yeah, so, I mean, I haven't made MMOs in a long time, right? But 
the big challenge in making MMOs is the fact that you need to make thousands of NPCs, right? And so that meant that the answers that single player gaming uses, which is make, you know, props that are scripted, you just can't do it, right? So either you end up with a thousand of the same NPC, or you ha are driven to have to do stuff that is procedural or AI driven or whatever, right? right? And, and, and it, the, the solutions to get some of that inner life are actually not hard at all. A couple floating scalar variables for fear, anger, greed, whatever. Utility system. Uh, yeah, and, and you, you know, it doesn't take very much, but the pressure is towards what I would call a stage-crafty narrativist approach. Yeah. And so you end up pre-scripting the NPCs. Yeah. To such a degree, like, you know, in uh, Ultima Online, we did this. We had that kind of behavior stuff. And by the time we got to Star Wars Galaxies, the pressure on it was so much that we just said, we don't need NPCs. Let's just have players do all the jobs. And we turned what would have been into NPCs into terminals. Because we were like, well, you can't actually do better right now. They might as well just actually be a physical prop <laughs> with a button. And <laughs> Dispense quest, please. Beep. Uh, I think your philosophical point is, is well made, Raf. Um, uh, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, it, sort of, I think there's some simple hacky things that we can do by looking at the um, expressive affordances that the game gives yeah. the player. Like even something like, you know, just crouching. In, uh, I have crouched in front of so many dogs in Breath of the Wild, uh, <laughs> hoping for that, hoping to be led to some treasure, actually. I'm afraid. I'm uh, <laughs> sort of uh, 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 hoping to get a, uh, uh, something from that. But um, the way that Zelda Breath of the Wild um, rewards you with this little moment of interaction where my attempt to take a kind of a, a spatial stance that is possibly socially expressive in some way is just met by the game. And even though it's just simplest of mechanisms. Yeah. Uh, I also want to say that games about partners. love and romance are being made. Mm -hmm. They're just not being made with characters. So I think, you know, when you think about games as, you know, mechanics as rules and aesthetics as the outcome, the feeling experience that you get, in the middle is the dynamics. And like what we're talking about is the player NPC dynamic. It doesn't really have good juicy affordances for romance, but you can build like a game like Florence, which is all about falling in love. And it can do really well and be really lovely and people can love it if you, if you turn the mechanics and the aesthetics uh, into into the main part of the game, and the, the the disappeared dynamics are in your mind, right? So we know how to do it as game designers. It's just we don't know how to do it with, you know, first person shooters and third person role playing games. Well, and and VR actually is giving us some of those affordances. Specifically, we've been talking about gaze, and yeah. it's better, you know, particularly when eye tracking comes in, which is mm -hmm. certainly mm -hmm. getting close. We're going to have uh, excellent sort of gaze, not just on are they looking at me, but uh, I, I saw, um, I think it was Fove did this demo where you know, you're being interrogated and I, I happen to look at, at the water, uh, the cup on the, the table, and the guy bashes it out of the way and says, look at me, and it was one of the scariest moments right. I've had. You can trip that around because the same part of our brain that processes some of that fear and fight or flight stuff deals with arousal too, and the intimacy of VR, the, the physical proximity, the, yeah. You're acutely aware when you're within arm's reach of somebody compared to somebody across the room, and VR actually gives you that feeling. So if the AI is feeding off of those things, realizes that a character is right next to you, and you know it's very different if the character looks at you and the character looks at you exactly. like this. Exactly. So. Well, or if it's another player, and I think this is actually one of the things that we should always think about as developers, and as particularly if you're working in the AI right now, this idea that gaze is going to be so easy to track. Like, the machine is much better at actually catching the things that we're looking at and our micro-expressions than we are. You know, it's just like you can observe a date from a different table and tell whether one of the people is not into it. Like, a computer can look at your face through a headset and tell whether you're scared or whether you're, you know, looking for a solution or whether you're like really intensely focusing. And there's a huge potential to abuse that. Okay. So like one of the things that it's, I think it's very important for all of you to be doing is making work at that level because uh, if you don't do it, then someone who cares less about players will. And I'd like to add one small thing, which is at the heart of this though is the need to study and understand human behavior. Yeah. Because without it, it's all stupid pet tricks. And the example that I would give is, I, anyone who played Oblivion, 
especially, I'm sure all the women felt this way, but I bet a lot of men did too, found it super creepy when you'd walk by a guard and he would say, you know how to move in light armor. Mm -hmm. I'm like, stop it. What are you doing, right? They just are <laughs> weird. Eye tracking you no matter what and commenting on you uh, just apropos of nothing, right? And then they do it again in Skyrim. They still do the same thing, right? It's a stupid pet trick. It's trying to make the AI look smart and responsive, but in fact, not looking at what people actually do and making something really creepy as a result, right? So I think you have to study people and understand people for anything we're talking about here to work. And then if the game doesn't give the player an opportunity to respond in context to the NPC to the sexual harassment, then yeah. that game is yeah. taking a kind of philosophical stance. I, I want to jump an, off an ethical this stance. at the moment, because this next section selling the NPC. Um, here at the AI Summit last year, our very own Alicia Laidacker, uh, during the rant session, had a segment that almost got a standing ovation from, from the room. I, I do want to play that here real quick. have this great opportunity because we can actually interact with them. But honestly, I barely give a shit about any of the NPCs in our game. They're too simple. They're designed to either protect someone, kill someone, or roam around in a big city like a zombie. In short, our NPCs are lacking empathy and intelligence. And this is what makes us really care about characters in cinema and TV. I'm going to call this artificial intelligence. <laughs> I love that term, artificial intelligence, <laughs> and you'll find out in my rant tomorrow. Um, but what would that look like? You just talked about the empathy of realizing, okay, wow, maybe I just, as an NPC, said something that was, okay, a little bit off. Maybe I probably should not have done that. But there's plenty of other examples um, of... Well, that, that would require the writer not having done it. I mean, and that's like that's the, the fundamental point that well, Richard's making. Yeah. yeah, it's like, I mean, it's not like it has the capability of knowing what it shouldn't say. I mean, this well, is the whole in point. In that example, yeah. yeah. But there's thing, I, I used one that if I walk into the tavern uh, or, or the shop or something in, in a game like a Skyrim, and I've got arrows poked through me, I'm dragging, I'm at 1% health. Hi, what can I sell you today? <laughs> no, dude, I'm bleeding. I've lost an arm. So, uh, it, What's that, Bloody Mary? Sure. <laughs> True. Yes, thank you. Dragon's blood. <laughs> Two of them, please. I'm trying to keep my uh, my volume up. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, what would what would artificial intelligence, as as Alicia briefly described it last year in, in that clip, what would that look like to you? The empathy, the understanding that. You're caring for them because they're caring about something as well, possibly even you. Well, the, I mean, the, the, the part of the writer's job is going to be to identify what each character cares about because yeah. he actually genuinely doesn't give a crap about you bleeding other than don't do it on my floor, right? <laughs> and now that makes him a person. I believe in this guy because he's like, take that out of here. I don't want your trouble. Yeah, right? And won't sell to me until I've yeah. cleaned yeah. up, right? That, those are the kinds of things. And, and I guess the point for me is that in order to accomplish this, it, it takes the team working in lockstep. It takes animators and AI engineers and designers and writers all understanding together that we're trying to create something. It's not, it's not any one job's responsibility to magically make an NPC who'll do what I just said, right? That's a, that's a group of I'm people. I'm not representing all the animators and designers and writers. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I want to challenge that just a little bit. The challenge I would be offering would be, okay, let's cut the writers for a minute. Just cut them all, sorry. Right? It, it, and think about, okay, what can we get across without the writers? Because I think that's the way we need to think about this. We need to think, what can I get across? Let's, now, let's take away the animations too. Do I have anything to get across? <laughs> like, if I had a text output, is there any there there? I think often the answer is no. Right? Like, yeah. it, it, we put all the burden on the writers. So, just for a minute, do the thought experiment of there is no writing, right? There just isn't any. Do the NPCs have any brain at all? And that, I guess, is what I mean, really. When, when I think of artificial intelligence, I go, but none of them have hearts, right? How about let's use some AI to try building a, at least a rudimentary heart, right? And, and see if they do anything. Right? I mean, that would be the challenge I would want. Because even just, uh, what, I, I, what I hear you saying is, even if just in data, someplace there was a number that was changing because it felt, you know, 
uh, happy with you, Sad, in a similar mm -hmm. sort of way, but on a deeper level. Right. And I'll, then we can hook it up to writing here. and animation later. Right. So I, I, I think it's important that you've actually recognized that, like, one of the things that makes us care for others is that they're broken. Like, one of the most compelling characters in your favorite book is probably someone who has a serious character flaw. Um, maybe you've seen that flaw in yourself, and then you identify with that character. When we do write well, we generally focus on specifications for humanity that are slightly off in one of several vectors, <laughs> maybe even meeting DSM criteria, right? I mean, like, it's really, it's really unusual people, um, histrionic people, people that are emotionally unstable, people that are clinging and then cold. Those are the ones that we write about and care about. And I think one of the things we always do as an industry is we try to build either friend or foe. But like, what about the middle space? Yeah. The person yeah. that you're in love with who suddenly gets angry and doesn't know how to not throw things, or right. the parent that um, wants to raise the child but was abused and so therefore is just constantly difficult with a little kid, you know? Mm -hmm. what, what about an animal that's been beaten that you're trying to, to win back to trust? You know, that, that kind of a relationship is I think the thing where you really do have to do the juicy work of, it's not that they don't have lines or that they don't, aren't written, it's that they're actually something interesting to us. Trying to solve the problem and be perfect you're, you're trying to create a, a version of a human that isn't really real, or isn't maybe is real somewhere. I don't know any of them, but um, I love all my friends. I do, but um, you know, we all have our difficulties. So, like, I think it really is about actually really recognizing that when you're broken, you're more interesting, and it's the ways that you're broken that make people care for you. I think that's absolutely right, Robin. I, and I think that the kind of intimacy and empathy that Alicia is talking about uh, comes from when characters um, make themselves emotionally vulnerable, vulnerable to one another. And just thinking out loud, we've been talking about NPCs noticing what um, the player does do. I think that um, vulnerability is often associated with avoidance. And so maybe there's some mileage in noticing what the player uh, doesn't do, or it seems uncomfortable doing, and that might open the door well, to... Laurel uh, uh, the... Ah, the, oh, the Scorpion wonderful Scorpions that, example, yeah, yeah. It's exactly that, of commenting, wow, you really don't like those, do you? Mm -hmm. You know, and either then cackling at you every with glee every time you run away from it, or saying, hey, or, let, let me help you avoid yeah. those, or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Excellent. Um, Warren, I, I've, I've left this up here for a little bit, but he was actually touching on a lot of the same things. His spilled milk uh, thing, uh, how do characters react? It's going to be whether it was knocked over by mistake that the NPC might respond, whether the player was playing the role of a child. Well, I'll, that's okay, honey, you spilled the milk, it's okay. Um, or whether the player had just revealed that she was sleeping with the NPC's husband and so on. You know, there's all these different contexts to one physical event in the world. And having an NPC understand and react ac accordingly would be, would be monumental. How do we define that in a, such a way that we can even build that? I guess that's my job, isn't it? <laughs> or, or, our job. Yeah. Well, you know, one thing I'd point out, I think if, if we polled the room about whether or not they felt emotional connection with, let's say, their Nintendogs or their yeah. Sims, Mm -hmm. The answer would start being yes, okay? Yeah. And it's worth pointing out that those are simulation-driven, AI-driven little entities with inner lives of their own, their own needs, their yeah. own desires. And yeah, we do let them down. We forget to feed them, and we set them on fire and trap them in swimming pools. <laughs> At that point, that's not letting them down. Just um, <laughs> I feel like I let them down when I... You know, I'm so sorry. Let me down. fill the pool now. No. Um, it, I guess my, my point is, we have seen this work. Yeah. yeah. And uh, come on, Sims is what? Eight little variables on a scale that probably only need a bite each, right? I mean, yeah, come on. We can afford not to Simsify every NPC in World of Warcraft, right? Like, yeah. easily. That's tweet worthy. Do it. <laughs> but but I, I do think it's also, it's also a, it's a problematic game. I mean, I, The Sims was the first game I worked on, and my first job was building objects for The Sims expansion packs on Sims 2. And trying to design things to go into that system was incredibly difficult, because what ends up happening is you, 
you hack together a, you know, a terrain basically of interest for all the, all the AIs, and then they're all running around on this terrain. And basically what they're doing is they're listening to the objects which are echoing you know, affordances back to them, and then they're choosing those affordances based on a stack-based ranking on the sliders. But then when you try to build a new object and insert it into that system, it has to get along with all the other objects in the system. So every expansion pack is like, it's like if you think of the Death Star, and you have to peel one panel off, and then like wire in a thing, and then put the panel back on, and then it just fucking breaks. So the game, like 90% of the design on the expansion pack team was, idealize what an object would do, then have someone try to make it and shove it into the game, and then fix all the ways that it breaks by tuning it. And we used to call Edith the thing that you used to tune that game, the crippler, because you just had to do all this like ninnying tweaking and constantly evaluating what, what they were doing. And a lot of times, you were just guessing. You were literally guessing what they were doing. They were like creatures of their own will, you know? And uh, like bugs that I had to deal with on that game included like time passing differently on different lots, broke the treadmill so that people just were always stinky when they were working out at a gym, you know, or working out at home. And so like it seems so easy, but there's a reason no one has done it because well, it is actually incredibly difficult to, to sort of deal with that mess so that sounds like something to throw at the machine learning system yeah, so that we don't have to do it anymore. Dave, go fix that. Yeah, fix it. <laughs> I'm just saying design better tools for your utility system. But anyway, um, I do want to move on because we've got a couple other uh, topics that we want to cover. Um, narrative is something that, that we hear a lot about uh, over the past few years lately. Of uh, and, and a lot of people in academia are working on this of how do we create you know, stories, how do we create dynamic dialogue, contextual dialogue. Uh, matter of fact, we're going to be having a talk here tomorrow on, on exactly that. But dialogue and narrative are two different things. Mm -hmm. Taking a pre-written story arc and saying, well, we're just going to fill in different words, compared to creating a story arc are two different things. What would you want to see? Give me a vignette of, it would be cool if. So I don't want to miss the middle spot Right? Because on the one hand, you have the, hey, the entire narrative is crafted and I'm just along for the ride. On the other side, you have procedural narrative, right? Sure. There is a middle point where within Mass Effect, I'm telling my own story along with playing the story that they created, right? So that's, I think, something that doesn't really get addressed enough. I think everybody who thinks, you know, we really want more player agency starts to lean toward procedural which is difficult and a lot of times can't right now achieve the same level of, of quality generally as you get from a more you know, written story. But that doesn't mean, again, that they, we can't spend our AI uh, dollars and time on having my path to a story have more meaning and more recognition from the other elements. And again, it's That's having the NPCs talk to me about the choices That's that I made, right? Because I love Mass Effect, but it's always super clear to me that, oh, I just triggered the threshold where he likes me now. Right? I, and I imagine even like normal people who aren't designers recognize that too, right? Oh, I just finally won his love, which is not how people really work, right? So how can you make that relationship more interesting and more dynamic and have, you know, Morden actually recognize more of the small things they do in the game and not just the obvious things that are set up to make Morden either like me or dislike me? Is it, okay, I, I just want to draw a circle on one. The one thing in the middle that you said is, Every player can go off and play his own story in any game. You, I'm going to screw with the game this way, I'm going to do this. But it was the part about having the characters recognize that you have gone off the beaten path and adapt to that and react to that and, and join you. It, it, again, going with the improv. Mm. Yes, and. Mm -hmm. uh, and looking at things in the macro, too, right? Or, because a lot of times there's no recognition among multiple characters and multiple systems about what I'm doing in the game as a whole. Yeah. But you're trying to befriend everybody, right? And, and I think designers tend to look at it, well, like, okay, I'll do factions then, where if you like this person, this person hates you. But again, life doesn't really work that way. So some sort of macro knowledge of uh, an idea, I guess the closest I can come is the director in Left 4 Dead, right? The director in Left 4 Dead has an idea about what a good experience is. You're making your own experience, and he's kind of rolling things out for you. You could think of almost all games that way, that as the player's going through it, what's looking at the macro of the player's behavior, what sort of, ex what sort of yeah. world is he creating, what sort of experience is he, is he being an asshole in his actions but talking nice to people? 
Yeah. That's a that's a play style. Someone happens. should call him on that bullshit, right? Or, or not necessarily leaning so hard on the characters to do that job, but letting the environment do yeah. it for you. So, you know, the simplest version of this would be a game in which your choices actually change the way the world looks to you. Yeah. And like, you know, my next game is, is actually going to be procedural and procedural narrative and really large. Um, and I'm thinking a lot about this stuff right now. And I think there are just a lot of good ways to clip back on the things, like one of the things I keep thinking about, like if you look at a game like Destiny, which is beautiful, but like why model the buttons on the jacket of a body that you're going to shoot from 30 feet away and then loot? Like just why do it? Like that's someone's life. Like someone somewhere is modeling those buttons. Like don't do it. Just stop. Like just cut Cut with the detail at the level that it is just, it has no impact on gameplay. It's, we're not making a fully rendered, you know, you know, 60 frames per second Hobbit movie that needs to be badly edited, or are we? <laughs> you know, like why do that? Just don't do the useless stuff and then spend, like Raph is sort of saying, like just copy someone else's, you know, eight slider thing and put it on everybody and see what that does and skip the buttons. Anybody else? Uh, briefly on narrative, I, I do want to keep moving, but... So, kind of riffing on what Laralyn was saying, I think that um, uh, anyone working in AI who wants to look at um, uh, screenwriting uh, uh, education um, would find a lot of good stuff there. Um, we've all heard of the Hero's Quest, and that there's that kind of systematization of story, but there's things like sequence structure uh, breaking. You can break like uh, feature films down often into sort of eight or 10, uh, 12 minute sequences. When, and each sequence is kind of a mini story. I think it would appeal to anyone with a mathematical bent because there's this kind of fractal aspect to it. Stories within stories within stories, right? Like the beat of a single emotional exchange that unfolds over 10 seconds between two characters. You, you want into... to press the Save the Cat button to generate? Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that's one of the books to have a look at, Save the Cat. <laughs> And I, I just throw in one last thing that I, I, you know, back to what I was saying before that uh, human computer interactions are difficult, but why not do computer computer interactions? And you know, some of the, the, the most interesting uh, proposals I've seen are having AIs that can talk to each other. And you know, maybe there's some prescripted parts, but uh, the kinds of stuff Robin was talking about, that those AIs can be sensitive to the flaws that the other ones have because they're, uh, you know, they can be tested within the, the rigid uh, uh, you know, area of what they know about each other and not have the, the incredible difficulty of some random human that can come in and ask them any question at all. And they can respond to each other in ways that make the environment around you, including the NPCs, feel more realistic without you having to actually interact with them and have a dialogue and all the flaws of the fact that it's, you know, the fourth time you ask them that question, they say the same thing and they never say, why do you keep asking me the same question? You know, if you can do that well with computer to computer NPCs, then you can sort of get around that whole limitation. Yeah, or design a world where the, the narrative is about, uh, you know, you're all fragments of saved data at the bottom of a giant, you know, post-apocalyptic server somewhere where everyone's been uploaded into a metaverse and you're just all fragmenting and everyone you interact with is like fragmented in some really fucked up way and then like you're trying to figure out like how to get something done in that space but like people are like glitching in a way that makes their you know flaws exactly stop the, so the real more life. in it all, already um, but you know there's there's ways to write around it but it really like what i'm saying like skip the buttons i'm not talking about like the actual buttons i'm talking about all the ways in which we imagine there's data where there isn't data like what you what you're talking about is there's three vectors in this person that i need to figure out in order to get something from them and then move on to my quest and maybe they're not a person maybe they're an ai maybe they're a ghost maybe they're like a random you know half a robot, half person, who knows, you know, like, they could be anything, they could be another species, but the point would be to, like, figure out how to lower the, the valence that I need to think about in order to get at the thing that really matters, and I, I do think that that's, it's like systems writing, it's not writing and it's not systems, it's yes. both, which is one of the reasons why people don't buy AI tools, which I think we're going to talk about in a little bit, so, you well, know, but actually, it takes I put up a slide system. that says systems Yeah, it, so let's so do I, that. Conveniently, you do, fantastic segue. Um, systems, you know, it's a broad term, right? And I'm talking, you brought up the AI director from in Left 4 Dead. It was the most famous one. 
changed the audio, changed the, yep. the, the coloring on the sides of the screen. It changed how the content was being delivered and the pacing and everything. So that's a classic example that we're all, or, is there anything either that you would go beyond with something like systems uh, or it could do better or something that we haven't thought of that if the game, we've, we've hit a few of them here, so I don't want to re rehash, but is there something we haven't mentioned that if the game system under was changing something in how we were experiencing it. Well, what I think made the Left 4 Dead director so special and that I haven't really seen used again, disappointingly, since that was, what, 10 years yeah, ago? Yeah, a long time ago. Right? Is that the whole point of the director is managing your emotional experience, mm -hmm. right? It's all about your emotional experience. I'm going to take you up, and then I'm going to let you have a lull, and then mm -hmm. right at the right moment, mm -hmm. I'm going to fill you with dread. And then nothing's going to happen, so you're going to relax. And then, oh my God, there it is, right? It was an entire AI system built around emotion, emotional experience. And I can't really think of other games that have done that since. And that's where the magic is. Yeah. Because the magic is in the player's emotional moment-to-moment -moment experience. And you understanding that as a developer, whether you're a designer or an artist or an engineer, is key to you making something that's really going to stick with players. And so when any, any of the AI we talk about here, I think that at the heart of that system has to be that it's about the player's emotional experience and not just about uh, mechanics or pushing buttons or dialogue or anything else. I think it's easy to do with scary things. I think you know, that, that pacing curve is easier to do with fear narratives and you know, really high action games. And then I think to Raf's point, we've leaned on other players and we've just, I mean, in many ways, like the, 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 the sort of popularity of multiplayer games is reinforced by our realization that it's just easier to let other people do it. I mean, it, like I wasn't joking, like we couldn't have written an AI that would have been as good to play with for Journey as another player. There's just no way. Mm -hmm. And like it would have been obviously glitchy and failed all the time. And that like, you know, the fact that it's, that people read it as another, a, as an AI was, you know, I think it was a, kind of a deep commentary on what people expect from entertainment experiences. They expect to be, you know, sort of lauded and have everything be about them and it's all about them winning. But I, you know, to, to Raf's point, I think we've leaned really hard on other players and moved away from that kind of scripting of experiences. And fear is one that is actually pretty easy to guess because you can you can do things to scare people really easily. We have very easy fear triggers. It's like at our lowest level of cognition. It's much harder to hook us with romance or to hook us with mystery or to hook us with, you know, some sort of innuendo and like kind of guessing because that's when you start to see that, oh, it would be very difficult to, to really execute at that level. So I really wish somebody would build even just a, a basic soap opera. Mm -hmm. you know, I was thinking like that soap during system, the narrative, you know, the like, first narrative Like telenovela today. type stuff. Yeah, had a know? bit on... Uh, one I'd of the play that. And it was about romance games and about the tropes that they rely on in making romance games. And those Gee, tropes me. map directly to the emotional experience and the ups and downs and valleys and the red herrings and all of that, right? Mysteries have the same pattern. So really understanding those very human patterns, I think, are the key to you know, mapping out the emotional experience of the player in your game. Uh, Warren, in his thing, narrative, somebody used the, the, the term game master. And then again, uh, in his answers to me this morning, he talked about... Uh, wouldn't it be amazing if we could create a virtual dungeon master capable of dynamically changing the gameplay to meet the needs, fulfill the desires? And so in, in the Left 4 Dead, as you, as you rightly pointed out, it was a horror thing. I'm not fulfilling the desires. I'm, I'm saying, is it time for me to hurt you again? Yeah, but I think also, why make the player the center of the narrative in this way where you're fulfilling their desires and like making them feel like a rock star and like blah, sure. blah, blah. Like, I think actually the, that's, a, that's what our games already do. Like winner, winner, chicken dinner. Like you're the one. And then just like, oh, I want another one of those. Oh, I want another one of those. Oh, Jesus Christ, I'm drunk and it's 4 a.m. and I have to go to work tomorrow. Damn you, PUBG. <laughs> Murder Island, I hate you. I but like, thinking, we're. I was thinking Civ 5. Yeah, but, but we're, so, we're so good at it. You know, we're, we're so good at giving people that experience. I think actually one of the harder things is to do the stuff that Alyssa's talking about. You know, like, well, let's try and make it happen. Um, build something a little bit softer with a little less resolution in the graphics, but where the system is really trying to tell that story. Yeah, it, I think. <laughs> So, I mean, I'm, I'm totally on board with cutting the buttons. Um, <laughs> and, and, and more than the buttons, frankly. I, again, I think it's not an accident that Sims, Nintendogs, and many other games that achieve emotional connection use iconic mm -hmm. communication, use uh, different levels of graphics resolution, right? We have chased fidelity yeah. 
and all that's done is create a large gap between visual fidelity and emotional fidelity. Totally. Mm -hmm. And, you know, today we have servers for these games that are literally thousands of times more powerful than what we had, you know, 20 yeah. years ago. Like, like, insanely more powerful. And we're actually using the server CPU cycles on rendering the buttons on the server yeah. so that we can do bullet collision against them. Oh, which is like, really why? Right? Why? Well, think, and right? I think it's, it's a hard problem. People get like, ooh, that's a hard problem. Let's do it. You know, it's, it's bad. Not, it, that's no. the thing. It's Some, not actually, this, most of these things aren't hard problems. Yeah. When, when we talk about recognizing, you know, emotional facts about human nature, things like body language, or, um, you know, in a minute we're going to talk about content generation and recognizing things like there are patterns in architecture or, you know, whatever. The fact is most of these things, if people are just willing to, you know, venture a little bit outside of the field of game design, have been studied by people <laughs> for hundreds or thousands of years. They actually already boil down into convenient mathematical equations that could very easily be modeled and generated, right? The idea that, oh, well, how do we make a pet react or how do we provide narrative or whatever, okay, you know, you want to start studying procedural narrative? Gosh, go back to Vladimir Prop and start there right. and work your way forward. No. There is such an enormous body of this material out there. It isn't that we can't go find this stuff to build systems around. I agree. It's that we are choosing to build other systems, mostly rendering. The ones that interest the developers personally. Right. And there's a reason that The Sims and Nintendogs were so successful. It's because they are, uh, beyond what you're saying, it's because they are so accessible and the average person can't attach to them. Because they were made by diverse teams. When I worked on The Sims, it was 50-50. It was, it was the first job I had in the games industry. It was 50% women in the studio. I've never worked anywhere else that was 50-50. Not even in my own studio is it that good. Like. People from all over the world, fans that had loved The Sims, they just came right into the pipeline and became creators. Like, you know, it, I can't say it enough, man. Like, it, the, the narrowness with which our schools train us in computer science and AI, the narrowness with which we create the community of people in this room affect the breadth of the things that we make. And like, I think it would be interesting to think about the systems that you're all part of and how you could broaden those systems and make them more diverse and more inclusive so that you would get different perspectives on what was interesting. Yeah. So Dave, we need you to take all of the A programmers and give them a liberal arts degree, please. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Educate everyone. What, personally? <laughs> you are here standing in for all the AI oh, developers, great. so yeah, it's on you. Graduate college. Yeah. I, I, I think oh, actually, by the way, before we, we get too much farther, it's time to, to give Dave credit for, you know, how many people here are at their first GDC? Okay, so we knew there'd be a lot of you, and you've been really attentive. If we had to make up some, you know, presence who, who really wasn't here but kept saying these sage things, and he was kind of this ghostly thing, and it was the narrative summit, and wouldn't the narrative come up with them and call him a specter? So it, you've all fallen for it really well, and I love it. You probably got some more of this Warren Specter person, but I'd love to hear heard of him. Oh, my God. I can't, I, I can't wait until he watches this, and he'll emails me. We love you, Maybe Warren. I, that's it. That's it. Don't break character. I love it. Oh, <laughs> all right, so <laughs> moving on, we, we've, um, I, I do want to blast through this uh, section on content generation. There has been a lot over the past number of years, even here in the AI Summit, um, about uh, procedural content generation, which of course means so many different things, whether mm -hmm. it be you know art styles or texturing or creating buildings or uh, you know even just it started by roguelikes. We're going to create random mazes or something like that, but it's gone beyond that. Um, and it, a lot of the things we talk about, well, how do we create you know these huge worlds without you know, artists and designers sitting there and doing, you know, every single building or, or copy and pasting, you know, 5,000 of the same building. But well, I feel that there's something else that we could generate. It, what is it that you, in your design, say, God, if we could only just push a button and have this stuff appear, what well, would it be? One of the coolest things I've seen with using AI for content generation was um, the, the deep dream stuff that allows you to take you know, one picture and combine it with usually, you know, some artists, some abstract artists, and you get some beautiful 
mashup of those two. And imagine if the uh, structure of a level was, you know, the same for everyone, but each player could pick their own art style and have that be reflected in how that level looked. You know, it's something that we can individualize right now, and it's one of those things that computers do really well that, you know, doesn't get into the sort of squishy stuff that we're all, you know, having trouble doing. Yeah, I mean, just if you think about, like, a basic RPG where you pick, like, okay, I'm going to be the goth Lolita costume person, then just, like, everything in the world has got candy cane stripes and ribbons on it, you know, like, just make everything cute, you know, but dead. <laughs> <laughs> that took a turn. <laughs> yeah, it, for me, a lot of this is about making a, a data-rich environment, right? Because again, it feels to me like we basically settle for worlds made out of stage props and cardboard most of the time. And to me, one of the big advantages of AI is actually that it's basically it's patient <laughs> in that sense. It, it can keep recursing and adding detail that is actually real detail. Right? So to me, it's, it's kind of obvious and trivial that we can procedurally generate better trees using AI, or that we can even procedurally generate a better forest using AI. Sure, uh, fine, but that's just kind of linear extrapolation off of what we already do. You know, it's like speed tree, forest edition, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, what's more interesting to me is, can you do that but in a way that is data rich? Instead of just going for, no, let's plant thousands of trees, how about when I go look at a tree, it's way more detailed. Now there's an ecosystem in that tree. Now there's a burrow in this one, and you know the gophers live under it, and there's a woodpecker over in that one, right? That's the kind of detail that, frankly, we will never, ever be manually able to do, right? We just can't afford it. It's ridiculous. And it's exactly the kind of intelligently constructed, realistic, responsive environment. You want the woodpecker to know there's a gopher, right? Like, I'm not talking just shallowly. Again, it's not just splatting the textures. It's, can we actually create a data-rich environment, right? Because when we build worlds today, we build really big worlds that, again, if you strip out the graphics, actually have very few objects in them. Yeah. We, we actually do not make dense environments. When our notion of a dense environment is even Skyrim or, or Battlefield or something like that, and you tally the objects, you actually end up down in like, what, three digits? Mm -hmm. And the objects that actually interact with each other... Is nothing. It's, like, it's minuscule. Yeah, it's okay. very yeah. Short, right? set pieces are made out of cardboard. Yeah. Fantastically rendered to cardboard, however. Yeah, but what, what AI could do, even in a way that like, because it's... Um, it's kind of a fractal or segmented thing. Like, we don't actually need each tree to know about each tree, but we could do something really interesting within the tree, if that makes sense, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Each one of them could have variations and, you Especially know, Especially if, if you move away, like, so how many of you have seen uh, Annihilation? Any of you? Okay, so like... It's amazing. It's Go really, and see it before it leaves If you've theaters. seen Solaris or Stalker, it has some similar themes. So those are mm -hmm. both the old Tartoski movies. But, you know, there, there's a fundamental notion of, like, humanity and, like, what we try to model. And, like, what do, we, what do we hope for with contact, like, going into outer space? And, like, Solaris is a perfect example. You get to the planet, the planet is sentient. But the only way it can communicate with you is by making up like vague approximations of what your memories are and then making those physical for you. And all that really reifies is the fact that you miss being on planet Earth. So like the whole point was like you left and I wish you could go back, but when you do, all your family will be dead, right? Like there's a thing that we do where we recreate the reality that we see right now. If you, the tree example is perfect. Just don't make it a real tree. Like make it that you go to a foreign planet and then mm. you find an object. And when you look inside the object, there's more objects and you look inside those objects. And then like come up with a design of mechanics that are like interesting from the exploratory perspective that's very similar to when you're a child and you wander out your back into your backyard and then into the woods behind there and you find a stream and then you look in the stream and you see the tadpoles yeah. and then you poke the tadpoles. Mm -hmm. Like think of it from a mechanical perspective, not an aesthetic perspective. And then you get the dynamics that are so interesting. I think we over-focus on the aesthetic qualities because yeah. that's it's, it short-circuits the kind of creativity that you have to do as a designer. And like if you partner with a designer who has the kind of abstract imagination imagination about systems mm -hmm. and mechanics and how they create dynamics, you can move away from an aesthetic that is really costly, like the buttons, and move towards the tree. But you just have to abstract away from your natural sort of, you know, like when you first pick up a pen, you're like, I'm going to draw a tree. The tree that you imagine drawing on the paper is like 
like Raphael drew it or something. You know, like you imagine being able to draw like Leonardo da Vinci. But the truth of the matter is, is that you draw like a kid and like the tree is still a tree. It's just a kid's version of a tree. So like if we made a kid's version of that experience of finding the tadpoles, that journey is a really fun one. But it doesn't have to be here on planet Earth. It doesn't have to be this stuff. It can be abstractly related. And I think that that's, content generation is about, I think, getting away from this notion of reality and towards the notion of experience. Okay, cool. Um, we're, we're down to about five minutes, um, and I wanted to, to play this next clip because it actually does speak to the difference between um, the, the set pieces, the, the art, the stuff, the, the rendering, the world that we're creating, um, and what would be the equivalent of that? This c comes from uh, the critical, uh, what is it called? Uh, critical Play Project, critical which is a whole bunch of video clips of a variety of, of designers. I think some of you have actually been part yeah, of it, too. Um, and this is from Clint Hawking. And he was talking about his experiences in Far Cry 2 and something he encountered in his own game. And I'll, I'll go ahead and play the, the clip here. I remember um, when I first time the weather system in Far Cry 2, I was driving around. All right, I love that because we've all had that experience in games where it's like, oh, because of the sound and the, and the visuals and, you know, this, it made us realize, it, it's the, the suspension of disbelief that we all talk about in, in this. My question is, okay, I didn't want to get wet. Wait, I'm not going to get wet. That moment, what would be an equivalent feeling that AI might provide? G give me just a little vignette of, if I was in this situation, I could not stop myself but from feeling this way. I didn't want to kill it. Oh. Yeah. I just didn't want it. I couldn't put it down. Can I, can I piggyback on that? I was yeah. going to ask to go first because mine's such a downer. And, yeah. it, and it would be to, uh, and it highlights uh, what I think is a, a burgeoning problem for us all as developers of action games and other, some other kinds of games, which is that I think we're rapidly converging on the point where um, because of our representations, both in terms of assets and animation and dialogue yeah. and visual fidelity, where the violence in our games becomes intolerable to us. Um, and so my answer to this question was going to be like that the characters react to the violence in our games in ways that feel more authentic. Because yeah. right now they either don't really react at all because they're tough guys and they've got to keep <laughs> fighting you, uh, or they kind of do these kind of pantomimed, over-the-top hysterical reactions. We've all seen that, that animation, right, of the character doing that and then running away. But I think that... Um, I'm fortunate to not have seen very much violence in my own life, but through the representations of it that I've seen maybe in storytelling or in documentary evidence, human beings' reaction to um, violence is much more complex. Yeah. Our reaction to trauma is often very unpredictable. It either looks like no reaction or it looks like something unusual and unexpected. And so I think there is a cluster of hard issues for us here. It's not a complete downer because I think that it's going to inevitably mean that we have to steer in the directions that we've been talking about mainly for the last hour yeah. towards other kinds of subject matter, other models of human experience, right? And uh, that is the solution. To well, this well to build on what Robin said before about caring about, you know, damaged characters, if you are responsible for creating post-traumatic stress disorder in some character you actually care about, you know, there's sort of a an eco-style game where you're, you're, you're really responsible for someone else and things that you do maybe just to see, oh, what would happen if I blew this up and all of a sudden this character doesn't trust you anymore because a terrible explosion happened when you, you, you know, use your, your weapon. Uh, that might be an interesting way of, you know, very simple ways to, to make you care about some of these things. I think maybe the difference between what you said originally, I didn't want to kill it, yeah. compared to 
oh my God, I didn't mean to kill it. Look what I have done. And having the, the, the game sell that to you of, like what Noah was saying, of, oh, I have just affected well, this is, something. Yeah, this is, I mean, I think this is the, the beauty of games like Shadow of the Colossus and Eco is that they do, and, and, you know, Last Guardian, they build a relationship between you and a character. I mean, yes, the cameras suck, and, like, they, a lot of the, there are a lot of problems with those it's games. another AI problem. But, you know, I mean, there are definitely, like, control issues in those games, which, you know, are usually related to budget and timelines more than anything else. But, like, you know, those games do really focus on these, these narratives where the surface of, yeah, your control and your power is, it's a gamble bit between, uh, yeah, conscious reaction from the system or an unconscious or un unwanted consequence. I do think that that's, that's just good writing. Um, but if you could really build an animal that was an enemy that you also could create, you know, some kind of a relationship with through some sort of hardship at the end, like, it's going to eat you because it's hungry and you have to put it down, but you don't want to, like, that would be a really, int like, it, like a, a bear that you raise that will eventually eat you and then you have to make a decision at the end. Do you sacrifice yourself and let it live or do you take its life? Like, that's a, that would be a really interesting game to play and I think it would create a lot of conversation about what, you know, what games are about and empowering users. I don't think these things are impossible to imagine. I just think that we're focused on the wrong thing. A friendly robot named, I don't know, Floyd yes. who sacrifices <laughs> himself for you. Yeah. Like, we've been doing it the whole time. You know, Chris Crawford, actually, in The Art of Computer game design. There is a, like, a direct quote about this. He's just like, the more fixed bits there are in your game, the less of a good game it is. There should not be fixed data in your game. It should be dynamic. It should always be changing. The stories should be changing. The mm -hmm. characters should be changing. The art should be changing. I mean, he said this in 1982. You so know? Kind of the, the corollary to, to Sid's uh, game is a series of interesting choices. Yes. Interesting ramifications. Or responses. Yeah, responses. So, um, Warren, he says the easy answer is just an NPC would hesitate to go out in the rain, too. I imagine that, whoa, geez, it's raining, and have that be unscripted. Uh, but, or encourage the player to go out, oh, would you just get out there? I could see that. But what's when, another way that an AI would that just blow you away that, oh, wow, that just happened? Well, I, the, thing, the thing I don't like about Warren's answer is that it's still... It, it comes back down to the player at the bottom. Yeah. And okay. I, I want to decenter the player, frankly, right? Sure. The reason I love games like um, uh, the stuff done by uh, David Riley, right, or um, Mountain and yeah. everything and so on, is because they make you realize, well, you're not it, okay? Right. Inside the game, there is an inner life. Inside the game, there are systems, there are parts that are moving, there is clockwork and magic and soul, and all this is going to go on whether you are here or not, okay? Mm -hmm. And so, to a degree, I almost go the game that makes you feel guilty over killing something, or the game, that's almost just like, that's, that's the baby step to getting you to realize that there is an inner life back there. Yeah, that's fair. The step beyond would be, I want to be proud of that thing. I want to, you know, feel good because that thing mm -hmm. did something without me, right? That it's yeah. alive, that it's doing things on its own, right? Yeah. I want to, to right. the parenting center game. the player from this. Because <laughs> the raising a child it, game. <laughs> yeah, the AI, the systems, they're about conjuring a, a kind of life. And if that's the case, then the thing that would blow me away is actually not just the realization, holy shit, that's alive, mm -hmm. but it's doing right. things I didn't expect that weren't about me. And as an individual with a point of view. Yes. Um, Kate and Sergio earlier today in this very room had a really great example about um, uh, Navmesh uh, that's flagged for keep off the grass signs. So that the <laughs> NPCs will only go on the grass under certain circumstances. Yeah, like, like there's no know, professor. There's right. people well, shooting unless they know all the words to this is your land. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we, we are over time, and uh, I did, I'm just not even going to put this up, but for a second, Harvey Smith um, had jumped onto something, talking about relationships and everything, but I, this bit right here is every time we start a new project, we have to almost start from scratch. We need to kind of, I'm not talking about, you know, the, the coming up with the one way of doing everything, but he, he touches on the fact that why are we starting over and over and over and over again? And because of that, it becomes prohibitive because we, have to, we don't have three years to iterate on this system. So there could be a quite simple answer to this, if I can dive straight in, because we lack something that other creative industries have, which is consortiums. 
or consortia, perhaps, you know, where the movie studios get together and they agree on technical standards around like what the cameras are going to do, right. and then the and then the hardware manufacturers kind of manufacture that. And we have the beginnings of that with the kind of the stability of our hardware platforms. I think we lack it right now, except you know, in kind of part of it is work accepting the rendering. World, uh, the world rendering. representations are all different, yeah. uh, and so how do we plug into all that? that and so we have to establish not just the AI. Right. How do we represent stuff? Uh, right, right, right. And it is happening, right? I mean, in places, it happens in places like this room where we agree of, on the name of something like a piece of nav mesh and share our best practices. But I wonder as we go forward, uh, we could be benefited by getting together on an industrial scale. Yeah. And, and do that, more industrial organization. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> better or worse. So, um, real quick, give me two sentences. Your final wishes, if you had your AI team, me, all of the AI programmers in the world, and you said, I need this out of you cause, so I can make that thing that I want to get. What would it be? Oh, I'm here. I'm, I'm you know, thousands of AI devs. I, I've been putting I, want you, I want you to help me build uh, a very intimate romance about two strong black women who fall in love. <laughs> Oddly specific. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. No, you well, I, I'm embarrassed to say that I just, and maybe this is the most important thing, I realize that all of my experience as a designer has led me to think, don't solve the problem, I'll just have to design around the limitations. So maybe that's just a, a, a statement, you know, not to make enemies, but uh, the limitations of where we're at right now. That's why we're here, is we're trying to figure out what, what are we missing. So and, and you folks over here. Um, I'll, I'll go. I uh, help me give me tools to help me illustrate in my games the way that human beings struggle, and we're all just trying to get through. I think there's a lot of good literary, meaningful stuff. And it's going back to the empathy thing of the characters, you being able to be it malleable and, and connect to a lot of different things. But yeah, more human stuff. Okay, Laurel. So almost all games are online in some capacity now, and gathering metrics but certainly and especially for all the games that actually are online and gathering metrics now, please take some of that effort you're using toward gathering metrics and uh, looking at play patterns, and please use them to help the player experience and not just to make money. Okay, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Rafi, what do you got? I, I want it all. I, I mean, I want... <laughs> you're no, a big it, help. No, here's, this guy here. No, I want, I want to have the, the tools, the machine learning, the AI, the rich data environment, to be able to make a single, probably online, connected universe that we are, in fact, simulating down to the point where the little pink alien gophers on the 13th mm -hmm. planet around mm -hmm. that particular green sun, which was entirely procedurally generated, actually have a history and care about one another. And I, I want it to have all of that stuff and have all of it be alive, specifically because I want to drop a player into that world and have them realize as they play that they are touching lives, mm. messing with things that are alive, they are trampling grass that struggled to grow, God damn it, and you're stepping on me again to realize that when they build their virtual cities, when they conquer their virtual enemies that they are being colonialist about, you know, all of those things, I want them to realize that in their daily lives they do the same thing in the real world because I want the AI and the machine learning and the, the code and the systems out there to hold a mirror back up to us as humans. I want them to use that space as practice for being better here. So give me all of it so that people can wake up and realize what they do day to day. I thought yours was oddly specific. Wow, that's amazing. That was amazing. Um, earlier this, this evening I said, oh, I don't have an end slide to put up on the screen, and I, I just made this up. But tell me if this resonates. Not more of the same, more of the different. Not just better NPC AI, but better AI NPCs and a better game AI that makes the whole game better. Slash S, or S slash game slash world. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Okay? Right. Replace excellent. game with world, and I'm on board with that last sentence. All right, excellent. Again, sorry we're over time, but was this informative and inspirational? <laughs> and real quick, who here at some point in the past hour and nine minutes said, 
I have an idea of what I could do to possibly start solving some of these. Good. Oh, yeah. That's Yay. why we're here. Yay. Go forth and do it. <laughs> but be back here at 10 o'clock in the morning for the second day of the AI Summit. Thank you, folks. Appreciate it.